In April, as part of our focus on abstraction this year, we're looking at mark making in art. Now, mark making occupies a pretty interesting and singular place as far as being what we would consider an element of making art. And that would be true whether we're looking at stitching or painting, watercolor, collage. Making a mark is a distinctive gesture. There are many rather misguided ideas that believe that mark making originated with the as an abstract part of work. And we're here now to really look closely at that so that we can see that in fact that isn't true and unravel the history of mark making over a series of art movements. So let's start with the Renaissance. This was an era when the paintings that were the best paintings, the goal that was to be achieved was a seamless painting that had absolutely no sign of marks. That was the standard and the hallmark of all of the work during that era. And so students who were studying with masters like Botticelli were learning how to eliminate the marks and the brush strokes from the paintings they were creating. This was not a desirable thing. Now, there were artists like Rubens and um, Rembrandt who pushed on that a little bit and did exhibit some textural quality in the paintings that they, they created, but that was not really approved. That was pretty much discouraged and it was very controversial. It wasn't until 400 years after the Renaissance that the Impressionists started to really play with brush strokes and texture and mark making as a way of composing. Partly that was driven by a desire to analyze and portray light. Lots of Impressionists were very, very interested in how a surface that was lit at a particular time of day looked and how it reflected a variety of colors. And so, Sinya was one of these artists who was really good at looking at a painting and breaking it into small components or marks that when they came together in this sort of what is also called a pointillistic style, small points of color, the entire image was revealed. The Impressionist within the body of artists who considered themselves to be Impressionists took other approaches as well. It wasn't all about pointillism all the time. Claude Monet developed his own approach to Impressionism. And if you look at this painting of his, you can see clearly still that the painting is made up of a series of marks. And in this wonderful self-portrait by Berth Morisot, you can see how all of the marks add up to be the portrait that we recognize. And yet if I isolate one detail from that painting, it makes a really wonderful abstract painting. And so what we're really seeing here is over a period of artistic movements or art movements, and also over a period of years, the abstract abstract expressionism and the use of abstract art was really kind of unfolding even when it was not in any of these artists' minds to be headed that specific direction, if you can see what I mean. And as a matter of fact, artists like Van Gogh and Cezanne would have been horrified if they'd been accused of becoming abstract artists because they used the marks that they employed so carefully in order to create the overall effect. So they didn't see this as being something that was abstract as, as I, you know, it's so funny to look back on history and realize that wasn't even a term that existed. It wasn't in anybody, it wasn't on anybody's radar. Instead, they were exploring how they could approach painting in a new way that did definitely veer from what had been the standard during the Renaissance but was just a new way of painting. And in this case with these two considered actually post-impressionistic because pointillism was gone 
And now we had these strokes and very careful marks of sort of overlaid, I, I, I was gonna use the word interwoven, but that would apply obviously more to textiles. But in any case, you can see on any of the paintings that I'm showing you here, if I did a detail like I did with the birth more so, it would turn it into an abstract painting in and of itself that would be quite beautiful. John Singer Sargent was at the center of kind of a controversy when it came to using marks. And he was very proud of being able to portray realistic images. So once again, there wasn't really a desire here to, to lean into abstraction at all. There was just an interest in, basically you might think of this as um, uh, breaking a realistic image into a series of marks that all go back together again in order to tell the story of, of the object or the element in a deconstructive sort of way, you might say. And this is a quote about John Singer Sargent's work. Good painters construct passages and perhaps entire paintings from marks which do not bear any direct resemblance to the object they are depicting. It is well known and illustrated that even in Rembrandt's late work, that was done and it was a style for which he was criticized at the time. So now we're moving into an era, abstract expressionism and beyond, when painters did claim the title of being an abstract painter, and they now used marks in their own way, including this wonderful paint, painting by Cy Twombly. He did a series for each of the seasons, and this is autumn. And this is, if nothing else, a beautiful combination of marks. But the whole point is that mark making isn't abstraction unless the painter or the artist intends for it to be abstraction. And so you can see how much of this is really driven by what your end goal is. We talk about that all the time in CST. So you can be putting parts together or marks together in order to create a pattern or in order to create a texture, or you can be putting the marks together in order to help them build into a complete whole that is a recognizable something, or the marks can exist because they're a way which frequently abstract expression is used in order to portray emotion. And we've talked about that a little bit already too. Patrick Heron's Azalea Garden, again, meant to capture the light and the colors and to portray some emotional res resonance with the subject that he was painting. Of course, we've talked about Yuyoi Kusama numerous times. And in this particular instance, in this obliteration room installation, uh, I believe this was at the Tate in the UK, the staff crafted this room according to her specifications. And then the whole point was to invite literally visitors to the installation, to the museum, to take dots and she had a thousand or more stacks of little uh, stickers in all colors. And over a series of weeks, the visitors to the installation were invited to put the stickers anywhere they wanted to put them. And this was the result. And so this is a wonderful interactive thing that she's done here. And there is a short film that I think we can share in April that shows people going into this installation and how it evolved from being the pristine white setting to what you see before you and how much fun people were having and how engaged they were by it. But what we're also noting here is that the dot is one of her signature marks. And now she's actually invited other people to use that signature mark in order to create this wonderful interactive environment. Painter Mark Bradfield. African-American, um, fabulous paintings, and very historically bound in the subject matter that he portrays, even though these are abstract. And he has his own visual vocabulary of Marx and likens much of his work to what happens. And I, I've used this reference before, possibly with all of you, the beauty, the raw beauty of a wall that has had posters applied over and over and over on top of it. He likens his work to having that same sort of depth 
and history and frequently applies found materials and then sands back through them and continues to build up the texture in that way. Sometimes they're huge. And then we go back to Jackson Pollock. And of course he was well known for his paintings that were the poor paintings. And many of those are more linear than they are marks per se. But this is an example of one from 1951 that is obviously a series of marks of all shapes and types. Emma Thomas, this is an uncalled, uh, sorry, untitled watercolor. And she was one first in the movement as an abstract expressionist. Uh, she was the first black graduate from the fledgling Masters of Art program at Howard University. And this is what her early work looked like. And then she went on a hiatus as an artist, professional artist in order to teach high school and earn a living for most of her career and then returned to her painting after that. And at that point it had changed quite a bit and morphed into this style, which is also a series of marks now rather specifically and carefully chosen. And this piece entitled Blast Off was a commission for the Air and Space Museum uh, through the Smithsonian in 1970. Collaboration between Keith Haring, who was well known for his drawings, which started on subway walls and have been now applied to the model Grace Jones and a photo of Grace taken by Robert Maplethorpe in 1984. So that gives you a real overview and I hope uh, an exciting leap into the world of what marks can be. I hope you will start looking for marks and taking pictures and sharing them through the creative eye. And I also hope you will read the tutorial that I've written for April and launch a few of your own mark making exercises and explorations.